remember we talked about initially, gas laws was like the first part of chapter seven. And then this middle part was the intermolecular forces. Like why do molecules, some molecules like cling together? Why do some molecules seem to have no attraction for each other? So in this, remember there were the five. So in looking at the first one, right? Really looking at the first one right here, HCl, what would you say is the strongest intermolecular force? Mm -hmm. I think I heard it. Mm -hmm. It's not hydrogen bonding, because remember, hydrogen bonding only happens if an oxygen or a nitrogen has a hydrogen directly connected. So this one has a chlorine. So this is that dipole dipole. This is a polar molecule. Because it's got a chlorine, it does not share that covalent bond equally. The electrons hang out around the chlorine more. This side of the chlorine becomes more negative. This side becomes more positive. It's a polar molecule, but the term they use for that is it's a dipole-dipole uh, attraction. What about the one to the right? CH3, CH2, CH, CH3 with the CH3 hanging off. London forces, right? Remember, if there's nothing but carbon and hydrogen, then London forces are the strongest intermolecular attraction. Just because it is, ooh, I have too many, too many letters in there. Carbon and hydrogen only is always going to be London forces. What about CH three C double bond O O H? And hydrogen bonds, yeah, because there's an oxygen with a hydrogen directly connected. So that OH, that is the one to look for. So yes, there is two oxygens. So you ne definitely know that that side's polar, right? So where those oxygens are is going to be polar. Over on this side, this there's going to be a slight negative, slight positive. So it does have that polarity characteristic, but because this oxygen has a hydrogen attached, it can hydrogen bond. So that's actually a stronger attraction than just being polar. Hydrogen bonding is kind of like a stronger polarity, allows those molecules to have even more attraction. What about MgO? MgO is ionic, right? So because you see a metal and a non-metal. Magnesium is to the left of the zigzag line, oxygen to the right. What about this one over here? So if you recognize this one, this is D-glucose. It is polar, because see all of those oxygens, but look at those oxygens. What do they have? They have hydrogens on them, so that means they can all... So all of these OHs they're all going to be able to hydrogen bond. OH, 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 even this one down at the very end, they can all hydrogen bond. The aldehyde, the one at the end, can't. That one's just going to have that. It would ha add to that polarity or the dipole. But all those OHs means that they can interact with water. They can interact with other um, glucose molecules, and that's going to create a really strong attraction. And then the last one, calcium chloride and water. This one's ion dipole, right? So the way you recognize that is anytime you see a salt, metal and a non-metal, an ionic compound in water, that's sort of the, that's showing that it's dissolved in water. So remember that when calcium chloride as a, as a salt, wherever the calcium is, there's chloride ions surrounding it, just like we looked at with the sodium chloride crystal shape. But once you put these in water, the calcium's attracted to the oxygen, the negative positive calcium ions attracted to the negative oxygen of the water. The chloride ions, which are negative, are attracted to the positive side of water molecules where the hydrogens are. And that helps to disassemble the crystal so that all those ions can now float in solution. So that attraction that doesn't settle out, it keeps all of those ions dissolved. Okay, so those were just ones just to practice. Went through, talked about some of the attractive forces and how they relate to some of the biomolecules like proteins, DNA. And then we talked about this, and we really mentioned this already in chapter three, this fact that like dissolves like. 
like polarities, like intermolecular forces are going to interact better. So things that are hydrophilic are going to want to mix together. So that would be things that are polar, things that are ionic. Hydrophilic, remember, think things that mix with water, things that are water loving. Hydrophobic, think about things that are water fearing, that don't mix with water. So those are going to be those nonpolar molecules that would only have London forces as their attraction. Then that led us into somewhere, led us into soaps. So we finished the lecture last time talking about soap, the characteristics of soap, and then we talked about hand washing. Okay, this application of this amphipathic molecule, the reason that you use water when you wash your hands, why you have to have water added to soap in order to form the micelles, how long that takes, the whole reason for the 20 second hand wash is really because of this, and then how that nonpolar hydrophobic region on the interior of the micelles actually helps to pull grease, oil, and sticky greasy, lipid-coated bacteria off the surface of your skin and then pulls it into those micelles so that then when you rinse your hands, all of that rinses down the drain. So how you effectively really remove polar and nonpolar ionic substances off of the surface of your sin, skin using soap and water. All right, so I'm kind of finished up there. So looking at this, Vitamin C versus vitamin E. Vitamin C, along with the vitamin Bs, vitamin, so there is vitamin B1, B2, B4, B6, and B12. So this is like niacin, riboflavin, thiamine, um, cyanocobalamin is another one. So there's a lot of Bs. And so instead of using the fancy names, like vitamin C's name, it's actually called ascorbic acid. But it just has this like shortened version when they talk about vitamins. They do have technical names, but B12 is the other one. So these are actually considered a group of vitamins, whereas vitamin E, along with vitamins A, D and vitamin K. A, D, E, and K are considered a group. Vitamin all the Bs and C are considered a group because they have similar intermolecular forces. So looking at vitamin C, do you think that vitamin C is hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Philic, why? Because it has lots of yeah, lots of those OHs. So remember alcohol groups, that allows it to hydrogen bond. So this is all of the vitamin Bs and vitamin C. They are hydrophilic. They are polar. They can hydrogen bond. So they mix in water. So where do you find vitamin C? It's in. Where do you get vitamin C? You have a bad cold, so what do you drink? Orange juice. So there's a lot of vitamin C in orange juice. Well, orange juice is almost all water. So the vitamin C is completely dissolved, doesn't have to have any special way of getting it to dissolve because it has, it's a hydrophilic molecule. Same thing with your vitamin Bs. Vitamin Bs and Cs dissolve well in water, easy to absorb. They call these the water-soluble vitamins because they're hydrophilic. But then look at vitamin E. What do you see a lot of in vitamin E? You gotta remember what that skeletal structure represents. There's lots of what? Lots of carbons, right? See that long zigzag chain? Remember that you've seen those long zigzag chains in fats and oils. So this, yes, it does have one OH, and yes, it does have one oxygen, but in comparison, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. There's 28 carbons in that molecule. So those 28 carbons, they kind of like override those two oxygens. So that's a lot of carbon. So this acts more like a hydrocarbon and less like a water molecule. So these are what? Hydro. 
hydrophilic or, pho or phobic. They're going to be hydrophobic. Okay, they are going to act more nonpolar because of the very long, large number of carbon atoms. Those 28 carbons share their, elect their covalent bonds very evenly. This creates a really neutral molecule. The ox two oxygens are not enough to make up the difference. So they call these the hydrophobic Vitamin A, D, E, and K. Vitamin E. If you want to take a vitamin E supplement, ugh. <laughs> what is it commonly found in? Fish oil. Mm -hmm. Fish oil. Hydrophobic, right? Your oils, fats and oils, don't mix with water. They don't taste delicious. <laughs> Some of them have like a really good cover on them, but sometimes you can open that bottle and like you can like, you get like this weird fishy smell. So unless you're like into that, it's sort of like, ugh. Okay, hydrophobic, lots of carbons, sharing covalent bonds equally. These are called the fat-soluble vitamins. Does that make sense? Fat-soluble vitamins, they dissolve in fat. They do not dissolve well in water. When you eat these, they can get absorbed, but they do have to have what they call carriers, to transport them around in the blood because anything that's fat soluble or hydrophobic is not gonna mix with water. If you eat these and you don't need them instantly, they can get stored in fat cells because they can get stored right along with other fat molecules stored in adipose tissue or in fat cells. Okay, so that's why you have those two groups of vitamins. It's really because of their chemical nature and whether or not they dissolve in water or they do not. Hydrophilic versus that hydrophobic character. So we've talked about fats and oils. We've talked about like their structure. So remember that fats are found as solids at room temperature because they have lots of single carbon to carbon bonds in their chain. And you can kind of see how the fat in that little um, ball and stick diagram they did. Remember, anytime you have a double bond, it creates that funny little bend. But that first molecule only has one of them. So two of the long carbon chains are saturated because they're all single bonds. There's only one double bond in that middle chain. So see how that can kind of like straighten out so that molecule can get relatively straight and that's going to allow stuff like butter, bacon grease, lard, allows it to actually pack in tight enough so it can be a solid at room temperature. But then looking at the oil over on the right. So notice how you've got all those double bonds. If you have double bonds in every single chain, especially, that creates this, this one even looks like it's got like kind of like this kink, like a whole curl to it. That ends up taking up a lot more space. They can't pack in tightly. That's why oils are liquid at room temperature. So remember we kind of talked about these in terms of fats that you would ingest. The cell has a similar structure to fats and oils. Cells have what are called phospholipids. So phospholipids can be built from your dietary fats or oils. So if you eat fats and oils and your cells need to build phospholipids, it can do this. When you look at it, do you see it looks a lot like a soap molecule? Like the little cartoon image looks a lot like the head with the tail, except this has a head and two tails. So that's kind of the difference between. So phospholipids, very much like a soap molecule. In fact, this part, so you notice these long carbon chains, those are the nonpolar tails that a phospholipid has. So remember that these are hydrophobic. They don't wanna mix with water. And then this whole entire side over here has oxygens. There's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight oxygens in that one little side. But the really big kicker is this nitrogen. This nitrogen, which has a positive charge, makes this end ionic. So this end, by having that charge, is going to greatly increase its hydrophilic nature.
So we, they say that's the hydrophilic head. The part that wants to mix with water is on one side and you have these two long nonpolar tails sticking out the back. So remember when we talked about soap and we said, okay, well, soap likes to make those micelles. So soap molecules kind of look like that one, right? So it's the little polar head with just a single tail. And the way that they drew it, they said, so it makes a soap molecule kind of like a little wedge. And that's why when you put soap molecules in water, they form this sphere, the micelle, because all those little wedges like just tuck right down in to help form like the soccer ball or the circle with the tails on the inside. Do you see that phospholipids don't really form that wedge arrangement? Instead, phospholipids are a little more rectangular because those two tails, they don't like stick together. They're not as narrow as a single tail is. So that makes more of a rectangular shape. So this means phospholipids don't form micelles. Instead, phospholipids, when you put them in water, they automatically form a bilayer. So a bilayer is kind of like a sandwich. Okay. So it's going to, they're going to automatically arrange themselves. So the surface is going to be those polar heads, the charged hydrophilic heads, because the hydrophilic heads can now interact with the watery environment inside and outside of the cell. So remember, aqueous means water. So out here, we're gonna have water. Out here, we'll have salts. Out here, we might have stuff like sugars. So we've got these polar molecules, water-soluble vitamins floating about. So those heads are gonna wanna interact with things that are like them. So all the hydrophilic stuff can interact with the heads. Same thing on the inside of the cell. On the inside of the cell, you have those hydrophilic heads, and they're also going to be able to interact with water, interact with salts, interact with any polar charged molecules. Sandwiched inside though, are those nonpolar tails. So are they going to interact with water? No, they're hydrophobic, right? So remember, oil and water don't mix. I think of the phospholipid bilayer as creating like an oil wall. So this is the hydrophobic region. And it really is very good at creating a barrier. So things that are watery, they can't pass through. Whether they're inside salts, they'll interact with the heads, but they can't get through that tail layer. That layer creates this barrier. This is what encloses the cell and controls what can go in and out. Things that are hydrophilic cannot pass through this phospholipid bilayer. So your cells created or, or form a bilayer as the cover. So you can see it here. So here's a cell, just a generic body cell. And that entire outer cover is a phospholipid bilayer. So they kind of blew it up so that you can see a little closer what the components are. And if you notice, so all the green that you see on the top, all the green is this phospholipid bilayer. So if you're thinking about parts of the cell membrane, there's really three different things that make up a cell membrane or a plasma membrane. Depends on like what book you read. The cell membrane phospholipid bilayer is the biggest thing. That makes up the majority of the cover on the cell and its big job is it's a barrier. It, does just, it doesn't allow things to just randomly go into the cell or out of the cell. It's gonna to help to maintain the boundary of the cell. But then embedded in the cell are those funny looking little yellow jelly bean things. So you notice those. Those are cholesterol. And this is an animal cell. All animal cells contain some amount of cholesterol. Plants don't make cholesterol. They don't need to. Animals make cholesterol because 
cholesterol helps to stabilize and make the membrane stronger. So, you know, if you heat up oil, it's going to start to get more fluid-like. Well, the phospholipid bilayer is this oily barrier. When at our body temperature at 98.6, oil is very fluid-like. And so it would be difficult to maintain the boundary of the cell, but cholesterol helps it to sort of like solidify. So this boundary does have a little bit of movement. So the membrane is not like, it's not like rigid like a plant cell is. It does have a little movement, but it's not easy to bust through it. And that's what cholesterol does, is it increases the stability of the membrane. You need it in warm-blooded animals. So animals that are warm-blooded, that have body temperatures similar to ours, all animals that are warm-blooded are going to have cholesterol in their cell membrane because it just helps the membrane be a little bit stronger. Third thing, though. So the third thing are all those blue stuff, okay? So you see all these, like, little blue globs that are kind of scattered throughout the membrane. Some of them are big and look like they go all the way through the membrane. They're on one side and the other side. Some of them look like they're just on one side or just on the other side. Those are proteins. Two kinds of proteins that are found. The integral proteins are the proteins that go all the way through the membrane. So integral, the word integral means to be inside. So integral goes from one side of the membrane all the way over to the other. Integral proteins, a good example of what an integral protein does is this one. So what do you notice about that integral protein? What does it have in it? It looks like it's a channel, right? Do you see how it looks like there's a hole going through it? There's a pore all the way through. That is a very common job for an integral protein. So example, remember we've talked about diabetes, we talked about blood sugar, and so we said you need to have insulin in order for the body cells to be able to take in glucose. So somebody that's a diabetic, they can't get any glucose into the cell without insulin. So insulin opens up these channels. So what insulin does is there's a special channel just for glucose that's in the cell membrane. So that channel, as long as insulin is present on the surface of the cell, that channel like opens up, glucose comes in and it lets it go through and it opens up and it moves it in and it opens up and it moves it in. It allows glucose to pass through the barrier of the cell membrane as long as insulin's present. It's a problem if it's not, but that's what a glucose transport channel does. You have transport channels for salts. You have transport channels for water. You have transport channels for hydrophilic nutrients because they can't just pass through the phospholipid barrier. They've got to have a channel. And in fact, your cells have specific channels for different things. So it's not just like a drawbridge where anybody can come in and go out kind of thing. It's very selective, which is why they call the cell membrane semi-permeable. Some things are allowed to pass through, some things are not, okay? So semi is sort of like half permeable is to be able to pass through. It sort of allows things to pass through, but it can control that. So in chapter eight, we'll talk a little more about some of the transport stuff we did in lab today. We'll talk about that more in chapter eight. So integral proteins, good example of what they do is they help in transporting molecules in and out of the cell. The peripheral proteins. So do you notice that there are some proteins that are like on one side or the other side of the membrane? They're not all the way through. Peripheral proteins. And you can remember the difference because, again, think integral is like interior. Peripheral is always around the edges. Okay? So the periphery of the house is like around the boundaries of your house. Peripheral proteins, a good example of a peripheral protein is this one. And I can use that one because we've actually talked about this. So that protein 
has carbohydrates on its surface. What have we talked about where we're talking about carbohydrate patterns on the surface of a cell? Anybody remember that? What? That was back in chapter six. It was in the carbohydrate chapter. It was really like the last topic we talked about in the carbohydrate chapter. We talked about how this pattern acts as identification. And it's going to determine if this cell can be given to somebody else or if you can receive that blood types, right? So you, if you remember back in that blood type lecture, there are type O had like three basic carbohydrates. All blood cells have that three basic carbohydrate. Type A has a fourth. Type B has a different fourth. And AB has a combination of both of those. So those patterns determine if you can take this blood and transfuse it into another person. So if you have type O, you have that basic three pattern. So nobody's blood would be seen as foreign. So you can give type O to anybody. You can give type O to type A. You can give type O to AB. You can, they call it type O the universal donor because it is that basic pattern. So I think of peripheral proteins, they do have a lot of other jobs, but one big job is they're actually part of what's called cell identification. They're on the surface of the cell and it identifies the type of cell that it is. It really gets much more complicated than this. So when transfusing blood, when trying to figure out if you can give blood to another person, they have to make sure that they type your blood, that you have a type that is compatible. They don't want to give type A to type O because that would cause an immune reaction. Type O person, they're immune to any type A, any type B, any AB. So if you give blood to a type O person that doesn't match, their immune system will attack and destroy those cells. Same thing when giving a transplant. So when you think about transplants, whether it's bone marrow transplants or actually an organ transplant, like a kidney transplant, they actually look at the patterns on the surface of the donor and the recipients and they have to match. It's not just simple carbohydrates. There are 20 to 30 proteins on the surface of cells that can trigger an immune reaction. So if you need a kidney transplant, and you think that this person's a donor, they have to first collect your blood, identify all of the proteins that are on the surface of your cells, identify all the proteins on the surface of the potential donor cells, and they have to compare them. If there's less than an 80% match, then the odds of rejection increase. 80%, so you're talking about 20 to 30 proteins. So you need to have close 18 to about 24 of those proteins have to match in order for you to be a potential donor for a kidney transplant, bone marrow transplant, any kind of organ transplant. And even then, there's still a high risk of rejection because your body cells look at the surface, which really your immune cells, constantly look at the surface of all of your cells. They're looking for something that's foreign. They're looking for something that's not right, looking for something that's abnormal, looking for virus infected cells, looking for cancer cells, abnormally growing cells. Your immune system is constantly like monitoring and feeling, it's really kind of crazy to think, but your white blood cells like literally slide against all these cells and they're constantly feeling those proteins. They recognize your proteins as you and any transplanted cells, if they don't match, that'll send off a signal that can cause inflammation and attack and rejection of those cells. So it's really very like, like exacting what they have to try to do People that develop autoimmune diseases. What does autoimmune mean? That is when your immune system attacks itself. So an autoimmune disease is when for some reason your white blood cells see some part of your body as foreign. Those white blood cells slide up against cells and go, this isn't supposed to be here, even though it's your cartilage. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start destroying it. Rheumatoid arthritis. 
So that's what happens. Your immune system begins to attack and destroy the cartilage between your bones. And then your bones begin to fuse, so you begin to lose mobility. So there's lots, like rheumatoid arthritis is an example. Um, lupus is an example. There's multiple, scler multiple sclerosis. MS? Yes. MS is another example. It's a neurological issue. So all of that, those surface proteins are kind of like the identification of you. And all of your cells have a similar protein pattern so that they're marked as you and it makes your immune system easier to find things that shouldn't be there. Which is, I mean, for 99% of the people, that's great. That like works really well. It just doesn't work so great if you need a transplant or if your immune system for some reason like decides that part of you shouldn't be there, then that's an issue. But that's a job, one of the examples. There's a lot of things that these proteins do, but I would say these are two really good examples of why there are proteins that are embedded on the surface of your cells or pass all the way through, okay? So that just goes through some more of that information. Little more about cholesterol, and this actually finishes up chapter seven. So cholesterol, cholesterol like has always had like this good and bad kind of connotation, really more of a bad when they're like, ooh, that has cholesterol, that's bad. Remember when they started trying to promote margarine? <laughs> when they were like, you really shouldn't eat butter anymore because it has cholesterol and cholesterol is bad for you. Here, eat this butter, eat this margarine <laughs> that has trans fats. Sure, I will. All right, so cholesterol, it, it contains a structure which they call a steroid. So all steroids have this four ring pattern. Three of them are cyclohexanes. Can you see the ring of six? And then one of them is a cyclopentane, but they're all connected. So they just call this a steroid nucleus. So steroids have a huge function. Steroids can be used to build the sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. Steroids can even be used to build bile. Steroids can be used to build cholesterol, which you need to help stabilize the cell membrane. So we've got a bunch of different functions that these structures have. Most of your steroids come from cholesterol. So when you eat cholesterol, if cholesterol is in your diet, this is what a cholesterol molecule looks like. And so can you see the four rings? So that's a cholesterol molecule. It's got that four rings, got a little extra carbon branching thing at the top. It only has that one alcohol group hanging off. Cholesterol, remember I said, it's important because it helps to improve the stability of the cell membrane. Warm blooded animals are what make cholesterol. We make cholesterol because we are also warm-blooded animals, even though people don't like to think about that. <laughs> so cholesterol that you ingest can be used to build new membranes, but we can also take and use cholesterol to be able to build stuff like this. So cholesterol, it's not difficult to convert cholesterol into testosterone. So can you see how it kind of looks similar? There's a little bit of a change, but do you see sort of a similar pattern? Testosterone is the what? Male sex hormone. Testosterone is what causes all the male characteristics that begin to show up during puberty. So body hair, oil changes, skin changes, the larynx grows, you get a bigger Adam's apple. Testosterone allows the growth plates to stay open longer, which means that guys grow longer for a longer period of time than females, and that's why they usually end up being taller. I will say in my family, I am shorter than my brothers. <laughs> my dad's 6'2", my one brother's 6'2", my other brother's 6'4", so I'm kind of short. <laughs> Somebody said that they thought I was over six feet tall, and he was like this tall, and I was like, well, <laughs> I'm not that tall, but I am pretty tall. But that's because of testosterone. The killer thing to me is this is one of the estrogens. So there's a couple of different hormones that make up estrogen. Estrogen is not like testosterone. There's only one hormone. Estrogen, there's actually a group of them. This is one of them. It's called estradiol. But this is the female sex hormone, one of the female sex hormones, 
Testosterone is made by the testes, so testosterone is made by the sex organs. Estrogens are made by the ovaries. This is what triggers all of the female secondary sex characteristics that occur. That all begins to happen again at puberty. So females, we typically don't end up with lots of coarse body hair. We don't end up with the larynx changes. Our estrogen allows growth plates to close sooner, which is why females typically have a, a early growth spurt, but then they stop growing earlier than males. Males can grow until they're like 21, 22 before their growth plates close. So you tend to see less, less of the, the height changes, but what estrogens do cause is they cause bone changes, especially in the pelvis. So the pelvis widens, cause breast development. They cause fat deposits to change, all of that to try and kind of get the body ready for any kind of um, pregnancy that may end up occurring. So all those changes are really geared for that. But what really blows me away you can look at estrogen and see it looks pretty similar also to cholesterol. But look how testosterone and estrogens are so similar. I would have thought that estrogen and testosterone look completely different because they have such different effects. But there's only just a couple of carbons and bond differences between the two of them. Pretty neat. Males and females both make both of these hormones. So even as a female, you do make small amounts of testosterone as well as estrogen, but females make more estrogens than testosterone. Males make more testosterone than estrogens. But there is actually, both genders do make both of them. It's just that difference in terms of levels of them. And that's all affected or controlled by genetics being an XX versus an XY. So X, XX is a female, and that's going to govern the levels of estrogen that are produced. XY is a male, and that's gonna govern the levels of testosterone present. Okay, so cholesterol. We take cholesterol and we help to stabilize the cell membrane, keep it from being able to be broken. We can take cholesterol and we can make these sex hormones we can take cholesterol and we can make stress hormones. Stress hormones come from your adrenal glands. Things like cortisol, the glucocorticoids, the mineral corticoids, your adrenal glands are little glands that sit on top of your what? Kidneys, good, yeah. So these are little, they look like little hats. Like if you look at the kidney, you see like these little triangular hats that are on top of the kidney, those are the adrenal glands. And so under stress conditions, so you get super scared, adrenal glands begin kicking out stuff like epinephrine. If you get sick, cortisol. If you get into like a stress situation, like you're like so worried about things all the time, cortisol ends up helping you to like deal with it, <laughs> helping you to like survive the stressful condition. If you've ever been sick and you're like, I just can't kick this cold, I still got all of this, you go to the doctor and they give you a, a shot in your butt, Okay, they're like, well, the nurse is gonna come give you a shot of cortisone. And so then four hours later, you're like, I feel so much better. <laughs> it's really like this big boost. It increases metabolism. It's really like this big lift. It's the way that your body tries to resist stress. Okay, but that's also made from, quarter, it's made from cholesterol. Last one, cholesterol is used to make bile. So bile is really like soap. And it helps to mix fats and oils in digestion so you can absorb them. So bile is made by your liver, stored in your gallbladder. It has part of that steroid nucleus. It gets secreted when you eat greasy, fatty foods, and it helps to actually coat fats and oils because you know fats and oils don't mix with water but it's kind of like how those soap made the micelles. Bile makes like a micelle shape and puts the dietary fats and oils inside and that allows it to mix and that allows it to get absorbed. So a lot of jobs that cholesterol has. So that's why people are like, cholesterol's bad. Well, cholesterol is actually really pretty important. In fact, in, in regards to all the things that it helps to do, but it can cause problems. So you go to the doctor, 
doctor, you know, normal checkup, they draw blood work. One of the things they're going to set off is they're going to send off a, a total cholesterol test. The total cholesterol, optimally, your total cholesterol should be less than 200. And again, kind of like gluc like blood sugar, they always just say, well, your cholesterol is 180, your cholesterol is 300, whatever. But it does have units. They just drop the units off. It is 200 milligrams of cholesterol per deciliter of blood. So deciliter is like 100 milliliters. So that's considered an optimal cholesterol value. Anything under 200. If it is over 200, that's when they start talking to you about issues that you may have, issues and health problems that may develop. So when they're talking about that cholesterol, they're talking about the carriers for cholesterol as well. So cholesterol is hydrophobic. Cholesterol is almost all that's just those rings of carbon. The only part of cholesterol that's got any kind of polar nature is that one little alcohol on the very end of it. So cholesterol cannot freely float in the blood. Instead, it has to have a carrier, much like a micelle. There are micelle kind of shapes in the blood that act as the carrier, cholesterol's inside. There's two different kinds of carriers. There's actually like five, but the two major ones are these two, HDL and LDL. HDL is called HDL because it stands for high density lipoproteins. LDL is called LDL because it stands for low density lipoproteins. So you can see how the letters come about, HDL and LDL. High density lipoproteins, these carriers carry cholesterol from one place to another. So cholesterol gets absorbed in digestion. HDL takes cholesterol and it sends it where it needs to go. Maybe you're building cell membranes, you're gonna need cholesterol. So if there's areas of growth or repair, you're gonna need cholesterol. HDL will take cholesterol to where it needs to go. Maybe you need to store cholesterol in fat cells. HDL can take cholesterol and send it for storage. Wherever the body needs cholesterol, maybe you need to send it to the adrenal glands because we're super stressed out, okay? You're gonna send cholesterol to the adrenal glands or to the sex organs, wherever cholesterol is needed. I think of HDL as being a transporter. So this transports cholesterol to a destination. It's cholesterol with a purpose. Since it's on its way to a destination, it holds on to the cholesterol tightly. It does not release cholesterol in the blood. Okay, so it doesn't release it as it's transporting. HDL like holds on to the cholesterol tightly. So it goes from this place to this place. Eight, LDL, on the other hand, it is really more like circulating cholesterol. And this is where the problem comes in. Circulating cholesterol doesn't really go anywhere. It's just in the blood. So it's just in the blood and it's circulating. LDL does not hold on to that cholesterol very tightly. So LDL molecules, carriers, LDL carriers can release cholesterol while it's circulating in the blood. But does cholesterol dissolve in water? No, it's hydrophobic. So as soon as cholesterol comes out of its carrier, it's not soluble in the blood, which is mostly water. So that cholesterol sticks to the wall of a blood vessel. And so that's kind of that image here. This is a blood vessel. So if the little LDL carrier is going along through, if it releases cholesterol, then that starts to stick. That creates what they call plaque. So plaque is this 
I, I always think of like plumbing. I don't know if you've ever seen plumbing pipes, like all the, the like the nasty stuff that like collects along the in the tube. And every once in a while, you have to like rotor rooter the thing out to try and get it all cleared. That's kind of what happens in blood vessels. So if cholesterol begins to collect along the wall a little bit, not such a terrible thing. But if cholesterol's there, then other fats can stick there. So anything that gets released as it's floating along. Fat, cholesterol, platelets, unfortunately. Platelets like to stick to things that are rough. So if cholesterol starts sticking, then platelets are like, Punk, they'll stick there too because it's sort of a roughened area. Over time, what begins to happen? Yeah, it's going to make the tube more narrow. So blood has to pass through here. So if you take a tube that was this big and now this tube is narrowed to this, that means less blood passes through. So this begins to block circulation. If plaque buildup occurs in the blood vessels that supply your heart muscle, you can develop a blockage and that can lead to what? Mm -hmm. So if it's in vessels supplying your heart muscle, what they call them the coronary vessels, that puts you at high risk of having a, a heart attack. If plaque builds up in the blood vessels that supply blood to your brain, that puts you at risk of having a stroke. So oftentimes people have to go in, they have to have angioplasty done, so they have to have a heart catheterization, so they look at the blood flow through the vessels that supply the heart. If they find blockages, they go in and they have to like try to get all of that out. So that's this plaque buildup that can occur. LDL has really been given the name the bad cholesterol, and it's because of this. It's the bad cholesterol because of the fact that it can build up plaque in blood vessel walls. L HDL really doesn't do that. So HDL is your, like, your good cholesterol. So if you go to the doctor and they do a total cholesterol, most of the time they break it down. They don't just say, oh, your cholesterol is 240. Instead, they say, your cholesterol is 240, your HDL is 100, your LDL is 140. Because the higher the LDL, the greater this risk of plaque buildup. Optimally, you want them to be, you want your HDL to be higher, okay? So if your HDL is higher than your LDL, then that's a good thing. If your LDL is higher, then that's another sort of like risk factor that comes into play. So what can you do, okay? So if your cholesterol is over 200, most of the time, doctors jump to step three. <laughs> you go in and you're like, your cholesterol is 240. We're just going to put you on a statin. That is like the, the most common thing. My mother's cholesterol was 210, and that was the very first thing that they said. And I was like, well, did they talk to you about anything else? No. They just gave me a prescription for Lipitor. Okay. <laughs> If your cholesterol is too, over 200, there's a couple of reasons. One, it could be your diet, okay? In terms of cholesterol levels, the higher the body temperature of a warm-blooded animal, the more cholesterol the meat is going to have. Cows, their body temperature is about 102, okay? They're the hottest of the hot-blooded animals that we eat, okay? So beef, this has the highest cholesterol level. Pigs, they actually have a, a body temperature that's a little closer to ours. So it's a little lower in the 99s. So they actually have a little bit less cholesterol. The hotter the body, the more cholesterol you need to keep the cell membrane stable. Chicken are even lower. Fish, they live in the ocean. 
So there's like swimming around in this 50 degree water. So no, they're very cold blooded in, 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 you know, comparison. That is why they have the lowest. So one way of trying to lower cholesterol would be to decrease the amount of beef and pork, increase the amount of chicken and fish that you ingest if you're still eating animal protein. By doing that, you would be ingesting less cholesterol. But the other reason that your cholesterol might be over 200 is because we are warm-blooded animals. We make cholesterol. And some of your cholesterol levels are genetic. So I have a friend, he's Italian. <laughs> and so he was like 23. And he was like, my cholesterol is already 260. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and then I look at him now, 35 years later, I look at him and I look at his dad and they're like the exact same shape. They're little Italian guys. They're kind of round, stocky build, exact same body shape. His dad, high cholesterol. Okay. So some of it's genetic. How much cholesterol your body makes is determined by what genes you actually got. So humans make cholesterol. In some races, some Italians are some that are higher, and some of that just comes down to just like living in different areas, different conditions over years and years and years. And so you saw higher amounts of cholesterol just normally. So genetics plays a role. It's very interesting, my family, very, very, like, no heart disease, no heart attacks, none of that. Like, cholesterol levels, usually pretty low. I think my mother's is, was really, like, as she's getting into her 70s and just not as active as she was, why it was higher. And I was like, my first thing was, like, they should not have put you on a statin straight away. You should have talked to you about, like, well, what are you eating? And would you be willing to make these changes for three months and come back and let's check your cholesterol then? Because maybe you've just been on like the cow kick and you've been having too much steak and burgers and you need to like maybe cut it back just a little bit. That is one of the big factors. Your diet as well as the genetics is going to determine cholesterol levels. Also though, there is a second thing that comes into play. Your activity. Exercise increases HDL levels and lowers LDL levels because remember HDL is is cholesterol to a destination. So if you are exercising, then you are going to have good cell growth and repair, which means that you have need of cholesterol to build new membranes. If you need to build new membranes, you're going to need your cholesterol in the HDL because you need cholesterol going to a destination instead of just circulating. So cholesterol can actually, you can increase your good cholesterol, decrease your bad cholesterol, and that can actually help reduce plaque. Now, it's not going to happen in a week. If you go out and start, I'm going to go walking today. All right, I feel good. I bet my cholesterol is great now. It's not going to happen like in a week. You're really talking about something that's going to take three to six months before you even start to see trends start to change. But those two factors, decreasing beef and pork, increasing chicken fish, increasing more plant-based, because remember, plants don't make cholesterol. So any kind of plant that you eat, you're not going to get any cholesterol in that. Peanut butter does not have cholesterol, which is hysterical that they put cholesterol-free. I'm like, it's a peanut. <laughs> There's no warm-blooded animal in there, right? So diet and exercise can help in reducing it. Statins can be used as a medication. Statins actually block this. Statins actually block your body from making cholesterol. So that can like force cholesterol levels to go down. Unfortunately, there are some side effects. Some statins can cause leg cramps, what they call restless leg syndrome to develop. Sometimes that goes away when you stop taking the statin. Sometimes it doesn't. Statins can cause liver damage because statins get broken down by your liver cells, kind of like the alcohol thing, and it can end up leading to liver damage in some patients. So if you get put on a statin, you have to go get blood work done every three to six months to make sure that your liver enzymes are normal, that liver function has not been affected. So because there's those negative side effects 
from things like Crestor and Lipitor that really shouldn't be the first goal of going to the med just because of the potential for problems down the road. And it really all comes down to this. If you have hypertension, hypertension is what? What's that? What's its common name? It is high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, then that means that there's more force on those blood vessel walls. More force on those blood vessel walls, and then you add plaque into the mix, those two factors really do increase your risk of heart disease, really do increase that risk of heart attack because of blockage, limit blood flow to heart muscle, increase your risk of stroke, all because there's too much pressure on those vessels and those vessels are now somewhat blocked. So those, these risk factors, having high blood pressure, if heart disease runs in the family, so, and by family, it's not like, well, my in-laws, right? By family, you're talking about like your parents, your direct uncles, aunts, your kids, that kind of, it needs to be like within a generation type of thing. And they have to be like actually related to you. History of heart disease, then that's because of that genetic aspect. So you may be making more cholesterol because of that heart disease connection, then that may indicate that you really do need to take a statin. So the friend with the high, high cholesterol level, his father had a heart attack. And so he was like, I'm not going to take anything. But then when that happened, that was sort of this wake up call. And it was like, well, if you have the high cholesterol and your father had the high cholesterol, and now your father's had a heart attack, then that tells me that you are also at risk of developing this plaque that could limit blood flow and end up leading to that. So risk factors really have to be like thought of or taken into account. Like I said, in my family, Nobody, nobody ever has any heart disease issues. And so that's like puts me at a lower risk factor. No. So plaque, it, plaque in the teeth is usually like food residue and such that builds up. And that can like disrupt like the gum line and start to like go down in between the tooth and the gum and cause an abscess and cause like tooth decay to get worse and such. Yeah, so they call this plaque as well. I know. There's a lot of things that like, why do they, like saturated fats and then a, what was the other saturated? Oh, and a saturated solution. I'm like, why do they have to use the same word? <laughs> but they do. So that's like, they're, they are two different things. When they talk about plaque in terms of blood vessels, think about like this stuff that builds up inside of the blood vessel tube and is going to narrow the tube and cause circulation to decrease. All right. All right, so that finishes seven. So, yeah, we're doing good. I'm exactly where I was in the other one. So eight, chapter eight, the first part of chapter eight, oh, it just does this. Really kind of still looks at a lot of this why molecules like to mix together, how, why you can see that these mix and these don't mix. So a lot of those intermolecular forces still come into play. Well, I did tell it to read. There. It's connecting to me. Okay. All right. So this is really about solution chemistry. So we've talked about mixtures. We know that mixtures are things that are physically combined. But when we talk about them in terms of a solution, then we know we're looking at a liquid. Okay, so this is a mixture that's a liquid. There can be solid solutions and gaseous solutions, but we're really going to just talk about the liquid ones. So in a solution, a solution is com composed of at least two things, but there could be hundreds of things. But the thing that is found in highest concentration, that is the solvent. So the solvent is what you find in highest concentration in the solution. And for us, the universal solvent is water. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, the solvent we're talking about, we're talking about water, okay, in body fluids. So if you think about saliva, Water is the solvent that dissolves all of the things in the saliva. Think about mucus, 
<laughs> water is still the solvent that dissolves all the sticky gooey stuff. When you think about the fluid in the cell, water is the solvent, okay? And you've got all the nutrients, gases, waste, everything dissolved in it. Everything that is dissolved is called a solute. So solute, you can have one solute or you can have hundreds of solutes. All solutes are the smaller concentration or lower concentration in a solution. And remember, you can have one to, well, we'll just say thousands of solutes that you can have in one solution. Just remember these things are not reacted together. They are only physically combined, right? So they're like floating together, the water and all those solutes. They don't react with each other. So when you put sugar in water, sugar dissolves, but the sugar is still sugar, okay? It doesn't chemically change. It just physically changes in its appearance. A true solution a true solution is one where you have mixed the solute and the solvent and it doesn't separate. It looks homogeneous, so you can't see any layers, pieces, or parts. They don't separate. It's homogeneous. These particles are very small. The solute particles have to be very small, like salt, like sugar, small molecules, they sit, when you mix them, they stay evenly distributed. And the reason they stay mixed like this is because typically they're all hydrophilic, right? So you have water as your solvent. Everything that's dissolved is either going to be polar or ionic. So it completely mixes and stays mixed. Usually you can see through them. So that's transparent. They might have a color. So they might have some kind of color to them. Like you can think of like Gatorade. Okay, so Gatorade is water, but it also has salts dissolved in it. It also has sugars dissolved in it. It also has red dye or green dye or orange dye or purple dye, whichever kind of color you buy. It even has flavorings, but all of that stuff are small molecules that stay mixed. So when you look at the bottle, it's uniform. There's nothing sitting at the bottom. It stays completely dissolved. The other aspect is you can oftentimes alter how much solute is there. This was a funny, a funny discussion last night in class. So coffee, like I am a black coffee drinker. Like I actually weaned myself off of sugar probably about five years ago. And so I just drink coffee black. But how many people like like one teaspoon of, of sugar in their coffee? Hands, anybody? Okay, so about one teaspoon. How many people like at least two? How many people are like the four? If I'm gonna have coffee, I want four. Yes, it's on my younger child is. She's like, I'm gonna have some coffee. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I just like it. Like, and I'm like, it's like, I can't drink that. That would like be like oh, so sweet. Okay, so you can alter the amount of sugar that's there. And so that's really common. Think of coffee as being like a true solution. Some people like a little coffee with their creamer. Some people like a little cream in their coffee, right? And so there's a lot of variations that you can do if it's a true solution. This part, when you see a solution, they'll oftentimes refer to it as AQ, right? So AQ or aqueous, remember that means that it's a liquid. There can be gases and solids, but we're really just gonna talk about liquid solutions. So besides a true solution, you can have other types of solutes to make up a solution. So the other two are colloids and suspensions. Colloids. Colloids are when you have big solute molecules. So large po solute particles, but they have similar intermolecular forces, so they stay mixed. So they are mixed into the solvent and they don't separate. But because they're large, they do affect the solution. Most commonly, they will make the solution thick.
So example, like if you have whole milk, the fat that's in whole milk versus skim milk, okay? If you've ever drank skim milk and then accidentally thought it was skim milk and drink whole milk, and you're like, whoo, this is like, leaves like, like a little fatty layer on the surface of your tongue. It's super, super thick tasting. Coffee creamer, like half and half, even thicker. Heavy cream, if you've ever like, like made whipping cream, you know, like whipped cream yourself, then you go pour it in the bowl and it's like, it's very thick. Those, that's because of the fat molecules in it. So those, even though it's fat, it has been mixed and mixed and mixed to the point that it becomes homogenized. It doesn't separate out. So creamer, jello is an example. So jello contains a large amount of collagen, and that is what keeps, that's what makes jello thick and keeps it mixed. Another example, gravy, right? So gravy has a thicker texture. So to get, make gravy thick, you actually add some form of starch, whether it's corn starch or if you add flour, you then boil it and stir it. And so it dissolves, it stays dissolved, but it ends up making that molecule thicker. So we use like um, starch in lab yesterday so that starch, I don't know if you noticed, it was kind of thick in terms of pouring. It wasn't a really high concentration, about a 2% solution, but it still made it a little bit thicker. So it can kind of change, colloids can change the texture, can make a solution thicker. The other one, though, is what's called a suspension. Suspensions, a suspension is when the solute particles do not dissolve. Usually, they're huge, and they do not dissolve in the solvent. But as long as you mix the solution, you can disperse the pieces by shaking or by making sure that that liquid is moving. They won't settle until you stop. So you can disperse the particles with mixing or shaking, but they will settle out. If you let it sit, so like if it stands. So if you have a bottle that's a suspension, and you shake it, and you look. It might look uniform as you shake it, but then you let it sit, and you'll start to see the solid begin to settle to the bottom. So I always think of like dirt and water, like dirty water. So if you have like a bucket, and there's some dirt in it, and it settles, all of that goes, to, all the stuff goes to the bottom. It's like the dog bowl. One of my dogs likes to go out and just like dig in dirt and he brings in his whole chin will be all muddy. So then he's like, let me go get water. So then I go when I'm like, what in the world? It looks like someone's planting something in there. And it's just like how he like rinses his chin is he just like gets it all down in there and then like rinses all of the dirt off of his chin and it all just drops to the bottom of the dog bowl. So you look at it and it's not like all cloudy, all that dirt has settled. So it's just a suspension. But if you like, mixed it up, then it would look all cloudy and such, but if you let it sit, it's all going to settle. So dirty water would be a good example. The best example, though, is one that my children just thought was the best thing. It was the reason to get sick. <laughs> it's because they would get the pink liquid. Does anybody know what that is? Oh, yeah. What is it called? It's amoxicillin. <laughs> yes. And they were like, I have an ear infection. I'm going to get the pink liquid. <laughs> so it tastes like bubble gum, I think. Yep. Okay. And when you go to the pharmacy, so you get a prescription for amoxicillin and kids, like if you've ever taken an amoxicillin tablet, they're like a horse pill. They are really large. So like you cannot get a child that's like five to be able to swallow one of those. So you have to get the liquid. So you get your prescription, go to the pharmacy. And what does the pharmacist do? He takes the bottle of amoxicillin off of the shelf, and in that bottle is what? It's just a it's just a powder, okay? And in that powder is the medication plus the flavoring and the coloring. 
Okay. Then he adds a certain amount of water to it. So he takes it over, he dispenses the water, he caps it, and he stands there and does this. Okay. He stands there and he shakes it and he shakes it and he shakes it. So he shakes it for a minute or so, slaps the label on, gives it to you and says, make sure you put this in the fridge. And if you read the label, what does it tell you to do before you give it to them? Make sure you shake well, okay? Shake well before you disperse because it is a suspension. Now, the flavoring and the coloring will stay mixed, okay? But the amoxicillin itself is a big molecule that does not dissolve in water. That is why you have to shake it before you actually pour it into whatever you use to give to the kid. Yes, my children just thought that that was like the best thing ever. Like they, and the other one would be jealous. <sighs> Why does she get the pink stuff? And I got like, cause she's sick. I wish I was sick. It's <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and then I'd smell it and I'm like, this doesn't smell good at all. They're like, mom, it's wonderful. <laughs> this is delicious. And I was like, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's amoxicillin. And so some of you are actually like, yep, I was like that too. <laughs> They don't use, um, I don't know if they use amoxicillin. It, it seemed like amoxicillin was like giving out like candy during like the late 90s and 2000s. And so a lot of times amoxicillin doesn't really work anymore because it was so overused as an antibiotic. So there's other ones. They have augmentin. So there's lots of other antibiotics that they use alternatively. But that was like the antibiotic of choice when my kids were little. But those are good examples of a suspension. I'll go ahead and stop. So what I want to do is I want to make the analogy of a true solution, colloid, and suspension, and relate this to the blood. Because the blood is actually all three different types. So we'll talk about that, pick that up on Tuesday, and then get into more solutions. So Sunday night, you have a couple of things.